Hello, my name is Dr. Gleisner, and uh, I'm talking about the PEDIC table. This is part one of four. From the video on the development of the PEDIC table, we know that initially not all elements were known, and when more were known, they were arranged in order of their mass. You can look this up on the Royal Society of Chemistry's PEDIC table, interactive periodic table. There's a history button, and you can see which elements were discovered. I showed you that last time as well. So, scientists try to explain the similar properties and chemical reactions of some elements with the idea that if you have three elements such as lithium, sodium and potassium, they fit into the same group. A scientist called Doberiner came up with triads or groups of three. And there you can see on the website corrosiondoctors.org, you can see uh, Doberiner's triads, some of them. This explains some groupings, but not all. Other attempts were made, and these were still based on the mass of the atoms of those elements. This led to the discovery that while not necessarily fitting neatly into groups of three, if you looked at the elements that were known, quite a few had a light, medium, and a heavy element with similar properties. Eventually, some scientists, such as Jean Courtois and Newlands, discovered that the masses were offset by a certain amount. Jean Courtois called a system the telluric screw, based around the element tellurium. Newlands called this the law of octaves, where every eighth element belonged to the same group. And here you can see some representations of Newlands octaves. Again, go going with corrosion doctors, you can see that some of the boxes were doubly occupied. And that, of course, was a problem. And still going with corrosion doctors.org. Uh, you can see the telluric screw. As I explained last time, uh, when you wrap the telluric screw around a cylinder, you can see that the uh, elements that might belong to a group are beneath each other, virtually. Not all of the elements had been discovered at that point, of course, and there was a tendency to believe that not many more could be found. Nevertheless, Newlands and Jean Courtois's idea of a periodically repeating pattern survived the process of assembling the periodic table. Eventually, when more elements had been discovered, Meyer and Mendeleev arranged the elements into a system which would eventually become the periodic table of the elements. And there's uh, Lothar Meyer's plot of atomic mass versus atomic volume. And you can see that there is a certain repeating pattern in this. And finally, well, not finally, and Mendeleev uh, arranged them in such a way that when there were gaps in the groups, he described from the properties of the surrounding elements what that element's properties would probably going to be. If you Google versions of the PIDIC table, you can see that there are quite a few different ones. The table that we are all familiar with is relatively easy to interpret compared to some of the others, but it may not be the most elegant. So what can you look up on the periodic table of the element? Firstly, elements are divided into two types, metals here and non-metals here. Secondly, all elements from left to right and line by line, or period as we should call the lines, have one more proton than the one to the left. So boron has five protons, carbon has six, nitrogen has seven and so forth. Protons are what give elements their identity. Neutrons have a function, but they do not influence what an element is, what its properties are, or how it reacts. The smaller number out of the two, sometimes at the bottom, in this case it's at the top, indicates the number of protons in an element. It is called the atomic number. It also tells you the number of electrons in a neutral, unreacted element. The third thing we can learn from the periodic table is that columns in the table are called groups and more on them later. So if I go down a particular column here, that is a group. This is group number seven and I know it says 17, but if we're going just by the main groups, then we can forget about the 10 in the middle here and we can just refer to three, four, five, six and seven. For the moment, we can safely ignore the block in the middle here. These are the called the transition metals. 
because they sit in between the main groups labeled above the columns or groups as 1 through to 7, with 0 tacked on right at the end. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, oops, 6, 7, and 0 at the end. The atomic numbers are greater than 20, and so are those of elements to the right of calcium. This is no accident. Electron configuration rules get a bit messy when you consider the electron configurations and the 288 rule no longer cuts it. The rules still apply, but there's just a lot more detail to remember and for GCSE level, this is sufficient to be able to predict the behavior of some of the most important metals and nonmetals for us. Let's be honest, we know in everything we learn that there's always another level of detail and complexity, but this is enough stuff to quiz you on at GCSE. I'll see you in the next part, which will be part two, more on groups and periods.